Welcome to the Adam Thompson Show. Cutting edge. He just told you to shut the f*** up. No Thanks for not calling me a liar, son of a the latest trending topics, legal cases, and social issues. In your face commentary on all subjects. Adam Thompson. You can't handle the truth. Adam Thompson brings his 25-year experience as a high-profile criminal and civil trial lawyer and gritty New York street smarts and attitude to the studio. Real unbiased talk. Those who want respect, give respect. You never know what he'll say next. This is the Adam Thompson Show. Here's your host, Adam Thompson. Okay, you know, there's been a lot of stuff in the news the last week. Almost any station you turn on, it's all about the Clippers owner, Donald Sterling, and the pretty disgusting statements he made that were recorded without his knowledge uh, by his mistress. And I want to bring in to talk about this indicated sports show host, uh, Sports Attack on the Sports Byline, Joe Spano. Joe, how you doing today? I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to be on. Hey, thanks for joining us. You know, uh, there's, there's been uh, every single station covering this without exception, as it's the most important thing in the world right now, it seems. And what do you make of this whole situation? Let's start from there. Well, I mean, the reason it's getting the attention that it is is, number one, they're reprehensible comments. The, but the reason it's getting the attention that it is and the reason it's taken the direction that it's taken is because the bottom line is it's costing the Los Angeles Clippers and the NBA at large a whole bunch of money. And that's why the NBA has taken the action that it, that it has. Donald Sterling's long been known as a bigot. Ask anybody that's played for him. Ask anybody that's worked for him. Ask many of those unfortunate people who were denied housing by some of the choices that he made in his discriminatory practices in relation to his real estate holdings. And this is not a new development. The way it came about, the fact that it was this far in the public eye and that Madison Avenue reacted and pulled sponsorships and things from the Los Angeles Clippers, if the NBA as a league didn't react this way, guess what? It would have cost them money. And these businesses are not about losing money. Right, and I mean that's 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 what my issue is with a lot of this. I mean, clearly, any intelligent person knows that these statements are reprehensible. It's as disgusting as it gets. There's no place, and I hear so many people say, "There's no place in the NBA for this." There's no place in society in general for any of this. Period. You know, so that that's that that's clear on its face. But my question is, none of this with Donald Sterling is new. You know, here's this guy worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He bought this franchise for 12 million bucks years ago, and now it's worth probably anywhere, depending on what estimate you use, between 700 million and a billion bucks. So this guy's in a position, regardless of what's happened now, he, you know, he's a litigious guy. He's been in court, been down this road, been accused of racism many, many times in the past. I think there's even a groundbreaking housing discrimination case against him that was filed by the government where he paid probably the biggest payout in such a case. So with the history that he has, and it's been so known, why now? Why 10, 20, 30 years later? Why not sooner? Why? goes back to the, to the previous question I asked you. Quite simply... Up until then, he wasn't affecting the bottom line of these other 29 owners and the league at large. Now, because this came out on TMZ and we all heard these horrible tapes and these reprehensible tapes, it's going to cost the league money. And they're all about covering their own rears and maximizing their profit on their investment. That's why now. That's why now. I tell you, but it, it's really disturbing to me because if the league really wanted to stamp out this kind of behavior and this kind of conduct, they would send a clear message whenever it happens. That, I, I don't know that they really care about stamping out this behavior. You know, unfortunately, for better or worse, and obviously it's for better, you know, this is a land of free speech, and no matter how bigoted and how, um, you know, how empty-headed you see is, you have a right to say it. So for better or worse, that's the case. And as long as it doesn't cost the other 29 business partners money, they'll put up with the one business partner. It's the bottom line, Madison Avenue, Madison Avenue reacted, and because they reacted, the NBA and its fellow owners took notice. 
Right, and that's, that's a big part of this, because, you know, look, Nazis can march in the street, the KKK can march in the street, there's First Amendment rights, and they're free, and it, it's actually good that the public hears, you know, nonsense and ignorance like that, because it educates people about what, what the right way and the wrong way to act and think is, hopefully. But the problem is, this is a private enterprise, it's the NBA, and they could affect uh, so-called uh, free speech because, listen, they got moral clauses, they got all different clauses in the in the, the bargaining agreements that they have, and they could just say that they could force this guy out. But now, knowing Donald Sterling, do you see him just walking away and quietly going off into the sunset, or do you see a long, protracted case where he's going to make anti, uh, you know, all kind of uh, antitrust issues and all kind of other defenses and keep this going in court for years? Uh, well, I think this is going to be in the courts for a number of years, and there's a number of reasons. Number one, the one that you, mess that you mentioned, and you're an attorney. You understand this. Unlike Major League Baseball, the National Basketball Association does not have an antitrust exemption, so it won't be nearly as easy for them to drive him out of the league. That's one. Two, Mr. Sterling is extremely litigious by his nature anyway, as he used to practice law and then migrated towards real estate holdings where he's, made, uh, where he's made his billions. Number three, there's a financial ramification here for him to keep ownership until he expires. And that financial ramification is capital gains taxes as it relates to passing this on to his next of kin. And the difference between it on while he's alive and after he passes is about $200 million. Right, it's, it's huge. A lot of people don't understand that, but just transferring it now or selling it now, what would happen in terms of what he pays in taxes? It's the, the, it could be anywhere from a $30 million tax bill all the way up to two to even $300 million tax bill. So obviously he's going to want to protect as, many, as much of his assets as possible. And because of that, he's going to fight hard. He's fought very, very hard for far, or far smaller sums of money than this. You're now talking $200 million. That's the difference between selling it, at, you know, selling it now at an initial cost basis of 12 and a half or $13 million, and if it's after he passes away, it'll be, at, you know, it'll be sold and whatever profit will be, whatever capital gains will be determined based on the valuation at the time of his passing, which would be upwards of $600 million. So you're talking about $200, 000, $200 million of a, of a tax liability. That's a, that's a ton of money and not something anybody would sneeze at. So for somebody that sued for far, you know, very litigiously for far less and very vociferously for far less, he's going to go after this to protect that $200 million with a great deal of vim, vigor, and venom, and he's not going to go away quietly into the night. I, I agree. I don't see it happening at all. And, you know, for him to drop a, a million dollars into an account to let some lawyers go at it and just try to get him the result that he wants, he could just be hoping that somewhere down the line, because of all the different stuff that could come out during depositions, you know, listen, they're going to throw him out of the league with a lifetime ban. He may start subpoenaing and ask for copies of all different emails and communications that other owners had, that players had, league officials, and show that he was doing nothing different than countless others have done over the years. But yet, because it was aired in a tape on TMZ, he's being single, you know, singly uh, thrown out of the league for doing nothing different than they've been doing, and it's been going on for years. And that could cause a lot of embarrassment for the NBA, don't you think? Oh, I mean, you know, the end, this is going to be, a, as Mark Cuban said, this is going to be a very slippery slope for all the reasons that we've entailed from the fact that these other 29 guys may or may not be squeaky, squeaky clean and Donald Sterling in the course of his litigation. And again, in matters of litigation, you know far more than I do. But basically, I think what you, the point you made is, is a great one. Quite simply, well... I don't want to sell something. You're going to force me to do it at a cost of, to me of about $200 million. So if I'm going down, I'm not going down alone. So you other 29 that, li that, that are throwing stones, you better be sure you don't live in glass houses because we're going to find out everything about you. So if you have some skeletons in your closet not dissimilar to mine, you're going down with me, and there may be a whole lot of our owners forced to sell basketball teams. And, and, fight what, for them anyway. right. and and the thing about it is I'm sure he's had countless, 
you know, meetings with these other owners and personal, uh, you know, outside of the MBA visits and trips and vacations and conversations. There has to be countless emails that just virtue of himself and his staff must have between these owners and MBA officials. Who knows what's contained in a single one of those that, you know, he may start making phone calls and say, hey, do you want this to come out, that you said this on this date and it's not much different than what I said? And, you know, that may scare off people because right now all the owners publicly are, yeah, we're voting. We want him to be out of the league. It'll be a unanimous vote if we do it next week. But who knows when push comes to shove and they start looking into the litigation aspect of this and what's going to be disclosed and come out, how many people may change at the last minute. I mean, do you potentially see that people may back off as some time passes or just for public perception alone they have to stick with uh, get him out of the league, we'll vote. Uh, to ban him, regardless of what the potential fallout is, if he has stuff on us. Well said, and I think I think you hit the nail on the proverbial head there. If when this goes to vote, I either abstain for one reason or another, or vote or, or do not vote to force Donald Sterling to sell, it will become a matter of public record, and I will be as big a pariah as Donald Sterling because by not voting for his ouster. I'm supporting what he said in some way, and that's a terrible message to send. So from a PR standpoint, regardless of what may happen going forward, there's no way any of the remaining 29 owners can possibly vote anything other than for his ouster. Right. I, I can't imagine that because imagine you're the Lakers, and he has something on the Lakers' ownership or you know any of their team officials. You know, what publicly do they say we, we, we'll abstain or we won't condemn it? You, you can't because then the sponsors are going to drop you too and then your franchise is going to just be hurt economically. So I think they all have to unitedly agree and unanimously vote him out and that's just going to then open the door that he's going to have venom, as you said before, against every owner in the league. I mean, this is going to turn into World War III. I don't think Donald Sterling's going to care at all. And at his age, this might even be entertainment to him. Who knows? Well, well, look at it this way. If you win, you save, I don't know, we, we've calculated it's somewhere in the area of $200 million that he saves based on the original cost basis of the franchise versus if you transfer ownership upon his passing and you go on what it would be currently valued versus the sale price. So we're talking about $200 million. Now, even at your guys' rates, so I'm going to have a little fun with you guys, even at the exorbitant <laughs> rates that you attorneys charge, could you possibly spend $200 million litigating this case? No, and the thing about it is there's probably a clause in there that the prevailing party will, will recover attorney fees and costs. So I'm sure. He, See again, you make great points. It won't cost. If he wins, it costs them nothing. If it if he loses, it's not going to cost them two hundred million dollars. So there's no way in his right mind he doesn't fight this because it's dollars and cents. And as much as this, there's a moral issue here, and there's a right from wrong issue here, and and we've all touched upon it. At the end of the day, do you notice where so much of this is going back to? It's going back to dollars and cents. That's where this is. The NBA, the, the, the league, and its fellow owners are taking this action on Sterling because backed into a corner, they were left with little choice because of the financial ramifications of doing nothing. So that's why they're doing that. Also, in turn, Donald Sterling will fight this tooth and nail because of the financial ramifications on his end. So unfortunately, while maybe you're sending a good message and you're trying to do the right thing, at the end of the day, a lot of people are doing the right thing for the wrong reason. The uh, reason they're doing it is dollars and cents. Their motives are not all that altruistic. Yeah, you, you got it right there, Joe, i got to tell you. Now, what about the whole thing about his wife, who obviously, if they do go through a divorce, you know, they're, they're in California, that's a community property state. She's going to be entitled to half his assets, which includes half ownership to this team. So there's a lot of speculation out there. What about her ownership interest in the team? Would she be able to retain ownership of the team, possibly, even if they get him out? You know, and that's interesting because it, 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 it appears that there, there's divorce pending, but it looks like it's been the case for some time, and they've been estranged. I'm, I'm under the impression as they're trying to, but it should be fairly simple in California, but yet it doesn't appear to be. So I have a feeling that 
maybe the Sterlings, for whatever reason, never get divorced because financially it's easier on both sides just to stay together and have this sham of a marriage where you're separated and estranged. So I don't know that their divorce is going to be a big factor in this. But she's done nothing. And, you know, people can say, well, she knew what she married. Yeah, she knew. You, you know what your spouse is like, but that doesn't mean that she has to condone it necessarily, number one. And number two, there's nothing on record about her doing anything. So I don't know what would preclude her from owning this franchise other than wanting to or backlash. And, you know, it's all very interesting where this could go. And those type of questions are very much up in the air. And I don't have any clear answers on how the league, the public, or how she would feel about ownership and if she would just want it sold and she'd want her money. Well, it's interesting. It's interesting questions. And another big area that, that, that strikes me with all this is, you know, racism from all different aspects. I mean, since this has come out, there's been so many tweets and so many different comments made on this. One was from, uh, you know, former ex nick great Larry Johnson, and he tweeted immediately following, you know, this coming out to the public, that there should be an all-black league where it's all-black players, all-black owners, and all-black leadership, basically. And, you know, I find that to be a troubling comment because I know if there was a comment made by white ownership saying the same thing, there should be an all-white league, everyone would be up in arms. So how does Larry Johnson get away with saying there should be an all-black league with just black players and black owners? Well, he shouldn't, but Larry Johnson's not in a position of power where him spouting such an opinion really has far-reaching effect on anybody, I guess. But I, I agree with you. That's as racially insensitive as, in many ways, as the discriminatory practices of Donald Sterling. You want to exclude white people from all... You've basically said that your league is African-American only. So we as white people, we're excluded. So your, your way of, of combating racism that's been, that's been, you know, uh, been placed on your people for infinite number of years, your answer is to place racism and, 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 be, and discriminate against other people, those that have discriminated against you. That doesn't work. Separate but equal is inherently unequal, and that certainly won't work. So to me, that's every bit as racist and discriminatory as the actions and comments of Donald Sterling. Larry Johnson should really be ashamed of himself, and there, there's no reason to continue this exclusionary practice. Right. The, the, the goal should be to include everybody and get past these kind of comments and behavior, not create another situation to inflame it worse. And just, just for, for way of a point of order, let's say, Johnson's an exec with the Knicks for the last two years, as far as I understand it. And the team right now, with Phil Jackson just taking over, is deciding what his role will be. But the last two years, he's been a team exec. So here's a team executive, another team leader, uh, part of an ownership, basically, part of that hierarchy, making such a comment. So if the shoe was on the other foot, what if this comment was part of the tape and it was Sterling saying it, that we need an all-white league with all-white owners and all-white players? Uh, they would, that would probably be the lead story that he said that on the tape. No, there's no question about it. And unfortunately, see, African Americans have been victims of discrimination in this country for better than 200 years. And again, I'm not, I'm not going to give everybody a history lesson because that's not why you brought me on. But let, let's be real simple about it. They, will, they were brought here for all the wrong reasons. And we'll roll it forward. And for the, for the entire 200-plus years that there's been African Americans in this country, they've been discriminated against. You go all the way back to the Constitution where in all reality it said all men were created equal. It didn't mean all men. It meant all white men. Were, and all men were created equal, unfortunately. We need to take it a step further. All rich white men, property right, owners. That's exactly <laughs> it, wearing powdered wigs. You know, so you kind of roll this forward, and African Americans have been discriminated against for their entire 250-plus years, or however many, I think it's around that number, in this country. It's wrong. It's terrible. The, but because of that, they're given a lot of latitude and a lot more latitude than us in the majority as, as Caucasian Americans are given when we make 
inflammatory and racist statements. And because of that, Larry Johnson's been in many ways given a free pass. Now, if it comes to light and, 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 people, and people really start to get upset about these statements that Larry Johnson made, and it all goes back to money, and if some people stop advertising with the Knicks and there's an outcry, Larry Johnson will very quietly be dismissed by the New York Knicks from his job. But I don't think he's so far in the public eye as a, as a Knick executive, and I don't think for the reasons I just entailed there'll be that kind of outcry. It's not fair, it's not right, but the realities are the African-American community, when they choose to lash back in response to the Caucasian community and their discrimination against the African-American community, they get a lot more leeway and they can say some extremely inflammatory things without backlash because it's not politically correct for Caucasian Americans to call them out on their discriminatory practices and their discriminatory language and inflammatory language. It's not fair, but it is that. Well, the, uh, the ironic thing that, that segues from this is, you know, since this has happened, there have been all, you know, the outcries for him to sell the team. We need new ownership. And the names that have come up have been Magic Johnson, even Oprah Winfrey, and then Floyd Merriweather. And it's almost like presumed that um, an African-American has to be the person at the forefront to buy the team. And why is that? Why can't it just be any suitable person that has the ability to be a good owner and has good character to step in? Why do they feel compelled that all the names being floated out there seem to only be African Americans? I don't understand that either. I, I've never understood that. I don't understand it. Unfortunately, and again, I'm going to get political. <laughs> a lot of your audience may not like it. I, I, I tend to you know, have strong opinions. I like a hey, lot Joe, of times, let it let it rip, Joe. Uh, My show a is a lot of times unfortunately get. the way discrimination is combated is with discrimination. You know, you go all the way back and you know, I'm, a lot of people are gonna call you and after you're done with me and chew you out as a concern to having me on and they're gonna call me a bigot, but the realities are all affirmative action was was reverse, discrim well, it was reverse discrimination. It basically said if you had two equal candidates for a position, hire the minority. Well, that's discrimination also. So a lot of times, unfortunately, what ends up happening is you end up fighting discrimination with discrimination in the other direction, which really solves nothing. It ends up putting the two sides at even further at opposite ends of the spectrum, it ends up causing more acrimony between two sides, and it really solves nothing, and it continues to keep these two groups separate. It doesn't solve the problem. It only exacerbates it. Racist against African Americans, because now you're saying, well, basically, if we don't give you an edge, you're incapable. Right. It, 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 a, lot of, you know, a lot of times when we pander to groups because they have been discriminated against, you could either look at it as reverse discrimination, or you could even look at it as, well, kind of quietly we're saying, you're not really equal to us, and you're not capable on your own unless we give you an advantage. And that's every bit as racist as basically coming out and saying, we don't like you, we don't want to be around you. Maybe no, that's, it's that's even very, worse. That's very well spoken, because that's what I've always thought, too. It's basically saying you're still not on equal footing, because we have to give you some kind of edge, or otherwise you could never just get that job on your own, and, and that sends a wrong message, too. That's why I'm saying, at what point do you say it's an, you put an end to it, and you just move forward? I mean, again, there's, there's just so much. You know, we're, we're running out of time. I only got time, really, for one more, one more question on this. Uh, how do you see this all ending up? Where, where do you see us in the next year from now, based on all of this? A year from now, he'll still, you know, obviously his ban is a lifetime ban. Uh, he'll pay his, what to him is a tiny fine. But this will be tied up in litigation because this is not going away easy. It's going to take a long time. If they had an anti, if they had an antitrust, if they had an antitrust exemption like Major League Baseball, it'd be a lot easier to exclude them from their private country club. They don't, so they, are, they have to operate under the same rules of big business that every other business in the United States has to operate under. So, man, this is going to be tied up in litigation for what potentially could be a very, very long time. 
Well, I agree with you, Joe. Joe, I got to get you back on the show. Everybody, Joe Spano, syndicated sports show host. He's excellent. The sports attack on the sports byline. Joe, come visit us again. Uh, lots more to talk about. Folks, this is just the beginning with uh, uh, Donald Sterling in this whole Clippers episode. We're going to be talking about this for uh, a few years to come. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Hey, man, my pleasure. Anytime you ever need me again, you know, it, you just get a hold of me, get a hold of Mark, we'll make it happen for you. You got it, buddy. It's always Thank a pleasure you. to have you on. Take care, Joe. Bye-bye now. Okay. Okay, everybody. My next guest on the Adam Thompson Show today needs no introduction. If you're a baseball fan, particularly a New York's Mets fan, everybody knows the one and only great Mookie Wilson. Mookie, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, the place is strictly all mine. Uh, you know, Mookie, you were one of the, the stars and one of the leaders of the 96 Mets team that everybody knows, probably one of the greatest teams ever assembled. Um, and you have a new book coming out, and everybody, if you haven't heard about it yet, you need to get to get up on your sports and get ready. Uh, Mookie has a new book that's just getting released. Um, go, every story, you'll find it everywhere over the Internet. Everywhere. Mookie, tell us the name of the book, the best place to get it. All right, the name of the book is Mookie, um, Baseball Life and the 86 Mets, and you can probably get the book at Barnes and & Nobles um, and just about every bookstore, um, you know, <laughs> in New York, probably by this time anyway. So um, Amazon, you can get it on Amazon online. So uh, there are a number of places, just um, go online and, and you can Google it and can tell you wherever it's available. You gonna be doing any book signings? Because I know just the Met fans alone that would line up for blocks to get the chance to meet you and shake your hand. Well, yeah, see, uh, I'm doing quite a few um, book signings. Um, you know, I, I think that you can go on and, and and find out where all the book signings are. Uh, I don't have all the battles off the top of my head of where they all are. Something nitty gritty. There's so much stuff I've been dying to ask you, um, and, and the book is just fabulous. Let me just start off by saying that. So now, listen. You were one of the main cogs in that 86 uh, team. Now, I'm a huge, huge baseball fan. I always thought the 86 Mets should have been a multiple World Series winning team, a dynasty. I don't know how it didn't happen. Do, do you share those same thoughts? Uh, well, yeah, I, I agree with you. I thought that we had a team that we should have won multiple championships. Um, but uh, as it turned out, um, things happened. Um, the team was probably disassembled, probably a little sooner than it probably should have been, um, you know, and we just didn't have the same personnel there. Um, we still had talent, and, you know, we just the, the personnel just is, was different. And the other thing probably is, is that the attitude of the players that uh, we probably was a little bit, you know, arrogant, maybe, is one way, one way of putting it. And if we probably was a victim of our own success in, in 86, and we just didn't uh, didn't improve. If we didn't didn't improve with other teams, and it was very difficult to repeat. Dude, but do you think that that swagger that you guys had, that attitude, do you think that was part of what made the '86 Mets the '86 Mets? I mean, it was such a team with personality. Well, there's no question that we had attitudes on that team. I mean, it was a it, some people say swagger, some people say cockiness or confidence or whatever term you want to use, but uh, we had lost that in. Part of that is because we had different players. Um, we didn't no longer have Kevin Mitchell. We no longer had Ray Knight. And, and later on, we didn't have some of the other guys. So Lane Baxter left us. McDowell, Roger McDowell left us. You know, so, yeah, I, we just didn't have the same personnel. And when you do that and they have a couple of injuries here and there, you have a different ball club altogether. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, a, after that season, I mean, when you, when you look at the breakdown of the lineup and the pitching staff, I mean, not since the Mets – I mean, I always thought the Mets always were able to capitalize on pit, and then they just needed to build a ball club around. I mean, you go back to the late 60s, early 70s, I mean, you go to that, that Met rotation between Siva, Kuzman, Matt Lackey, and Ryan before they traded him away. I mean, that's, that's a Hall of Fame a staff. And then you go well, back to 86, it's the same thing. You had good and you had darling. I don't remember a five-man rotation from top to bottom that was that good unless you go back to the early 70s Met, Mets team, ironically. Well, pitching has always been a Mets trademark, pitching and, and, and good defense. And when you don't have that, then you put an awful lot of pressure on offense. And offensive players uh, 
you know, it's just tough to put nine offensive players on the field, you know, that's going to produce the way, you know, the offense that you, you need when you have poor pitching. So when your pitching breaks down, then that kind of, uh, you know, have everything else to, to, to work harder or, or, or perform above the expectations in order to be successful in the Mets have been able to do that. So now, here's the 86 Mets. you got two standout rookies, which is so – it's rare to get one standout rookie. You get two. You have Doc Gooden, who's like a, the next coming of a Tom Seaver. You have Strawberry, who's got one of the most perfect swings you would ever see. Do you think that the Mets, Mets handled them? Do you think they, they, they really hurt them in their, in their development? Well, I, I think that any time you have young players, and you have to develop players two ways. You have to develop them physically, and you have to develop them mentally. And I don't think that we miss. When I say miss, that, that's all of us, players, management, everyone involved, didn't do enough to help develop these kids mentally. Uh, physically, they had all the talent to do whatever they wanted to do. But mentally, you have to be able to – to deal with success and to deal with the pressures of playing in New York. And I think, in, in my opinion, that we could have done a little better job in preparing these kids for what was in front of them. Well, you know, when you're living in the New York area, there's so much to do, so much to see. And, you know, if you haven't been exposed to that, it could be daunting and overwhelming. I mean, did the, did the Mets assign people to watch players like Strawberry and Doc to make sure that they didn't get involved in that nightlife that could ruin their career because they get involved in boozing or, you know, drugging it up or going to strip clubs? I mean, that's what, that's what young people do if you're not in baseball. You like to go out and have a good time when you're young. So you get this money thrown at you. You're a star. Everybody knows you. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be there. So did the Mets really try to do anything to help these guys to try to keep them in line? Well, if you're asking me that, did the Mets assign someone to, to, to be babysitters for these guys? No. <laughs> and I don't think that would have been a good idea. I think how you help people is to help educate them and, and, and to, you know, you know, give them at least a heads up and warn them what's going on. Yes, they were young kids and they had the city to themselves. I mean, they could have had keys to the city, for all I know. Uh, but, you know, they were just fantastic ball players who were willing to, 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 to do what it took, you know, to be liked by the public. And when you are a superstar, it's very easy to have friends. And sometimes those friends don't have your edges at heart. And I think with young ball players, it's very difficult to see through some of the the, the facade that ball that people put you through, um, pretending to be, you know, your, your buddies. But and, and in reality, they actually just leeches. And I think this is what happened with these two young men. And uh, I don't know if the Mets could have done anything more. Um, I, will, I, I felt they should have done more. I don't know what that could have done. But as a player, I don't think that we intervened enough. And I have to be put myself first with that because I certainly did not. Well, do you, what, what do you think you could have did differently? If you could go back in time with a magic wand, what, what would Mookie Wilson have done differently with those guys and the team in general? But if I had to do it all over again, and when we play, and understand that when you play baseball, your first priority is you you play in baseball. You're living in the moment, and you're not really concerned about what the guy beside you is doing. All you're concerned about is can he do his job on the field. Now, looking back, I'm a little older now, a little more mature, and I'm a little more observant. I would probably be more uh, observant on what's happening around me, looking for signs of trouble, and not being afraid to, to speak out if I saw that something was, you know, not normal and not worry about, you know, how the guy was going to react. You know, so in you, you, when you're older, you look at those things, and if I had to go back and do it, that's the one thing that I definitely would do. Now, would it make that difference? Again, I don't know because we're looking back in time. But it wouldn't stop me from making the effort. I got you. Well, on that exact point then, let's take a guy like George Forster. I mean, this guy was the force. When he was with the Big Red Machine, you looked at his stats and his, his, his numbers, and you're just blown away. The Mets bring this guy, and you're like, oh, Forster's incredible. And this is a guy that was pretty outspoken. You know, you didn't hear a lot of stuff about him. He did it in a quiet way. But this guy let, his, let, let it fly. If he felt something, he said it. And he didn't care if it was about the management or the, the coaching staff. And I, I give a lot of respect for that. Do you think that that hurt him? And that's the reason why they basically uh, they try to really get George Forster out of town? Well, you know, that's, that's a question that you really have to ask the people who are involved in doing that. But you are absolutely right about George. George is very outspoken. Um, he would say what was on his mind and worry about the consequences later. 
and that can hurt people. You know, sometimes people don't like to be, you know, they don't, they don't want to hear what your opinion is, particularly, you know, when you are working under them. And um, it, it may have hurt George. You know, it didn't help him, that's for sure. You know, but understand, uh, George's numbers weren't the same because, you know, George didn't have the same team around him as he had in Cincinnati. So that makes all the difference in the world. So, you know, even when George was let go, George still was, you know, he was leading the club in home runs and RBI. So it's not that he wasn't doing a good job. The job maybe it didn't match his numbers in Cincinnati, but he didn't have the same team. So I think it was asking too much to expect. I think even, even with different players around him, you know, hitting in Shea, I don't think there's been a power hitter that's come to Shea and ever produced the same kind of numbers that they had anywhere else. I remember being a Yankee fan when the Yankees had to play a couple of years in Shea while the stadium was being rebuilt. Bobby Mercer went from like 30-something homers down to like seven or something. And it was like, oh, it's the curse of Shea Stadium. I mean, that's a pitcher's park all the way. Um, so, but I just found that interesting because I think that baseball and all sports need that, people to speak out and, and say what they really think because ultimately I think it brings a team uh, closer together. Now, now you, you mentioned before about Kevin Mitchell and Ray Knight. I mean, they were such a big part of that team with their personalities, big talents, and then the team got rid of them. What, what do you think was behind that? Do you think they were trying to change the team's image or, or they were looking for fall guys? What, what do you make of that? Well, I think with, in the Ray Knight situation, I, I think it came down to, you know, contract. I, I think that uh, Ray Knight, uh, he felt that the Mets were compensating him for his accomplishments and, and what they were looking for him to do. Now, in, in Kevin Mitchell's case, you know, I, you know, I don't think it's a secret that um, the Mets felt that he was a time bomb waiting to, <laughs> waiting to explode, <laughs> and they felt that was better off to just, you know, um, you know, you know, get rid of him while they, he still had some value. Uh, I, I think they made a mistake there. I, I say it then and I say it now. I thought Kevin Mitchell was really misunderstood. I, I thought that he was um, probably carried a burden that wasn't his to carry um, and, and his attitudes. I, I think that his, his childhood and his upbringing probably misled people to understanding who he was. He was a fantastic ball player. Uh, you know, and his, his attitude toward the game and, and winning, you just don't teach that type of thing. You either have it or you don't. He was a gamer. He was a fighter in both ways. <laughs> you know, he will fight you on the field and also if you had to, but he always got his point across, and I think that's what happened. He put a little bit of fear in people's heart uh, and about the Mets, and I think when you don't have that on the team, the intimidation part is gone, and we missed that with great night and Kevin. Well, and I think that was part of the swagger. I mean, if you look at the statistics, I mean, after he left, he went, you know, he went to the San Francisco Giants, Kevin Mitchell. I mean, he had some monster years. He had the one year with the 47 homers, then 35 homers, 27 homers. Uh, I mean, who wouldn't want that guy in the middle of the lineup? You know what I'm saying? Well, it, and, it, it's hard to believe that we, we did trade that guy, but we did. Uh, we got a good guy in return uh, who had, he had good talent. He's a very good ball player. He's Kevin like Reynolds. But when you keep using the word swagger, that's something that, you know, every ball player just don't have that. And when we start to understand that it takes more than numbers to win ball games, you know, then we start putting together, you know, good teams and, and, and more aggressive teams and more productive teams because it takes more than just numbers. And you, baseball is all about attitude. It's about the chemistry of, of, of players playing for each other and wanting the most for each other. So that's what we have to start looking for. Well, I think that you just hit the nail on the head. You see some teams, and the chemistry is just amazing, and they just gel together like you could never imagine, and that's the difference, in, in, to me, the winning and the losing. And, you know, you see what happened with those Boston Red Sox teams that won the World Series yeah. finally. It's like, you know, man up, and they just played together, and they made it happen. And I give a lot yeah. of credit to David Ortiz leading the way with that and, uh, you know, Dustin Pedroia because they really brought – a team together and it shows you what just a couple of players can do you for one you know you look at ball players you never hear i've never yet heard a bad thing about say Derek jeter same thing with you you mention mookie wilson to anybody who knows baseball mookie's a professional player he was a great player he could hit he could throw i mean and you never hear anything not a bad guy in the clubhouse supportive a great teammate this is what teams should be made of players like mookie wilson's 
and I never understood why a management would break things up. So I'm going to go to a place that's a little dark now with you, Mookie. I never understand, and, and this is me talking, I was a baseball fan. I didn't understand why the Mets let you go. You had very good years with them. I mean, you consistently batted around 300. How did it come about that they let you go to Toronto? I don't get that. I never did. Well, well that was an uh, interesting uh, situation. Um, the Mets were just really ready to go in a different direction. And I was no longer part of that direction. Um, I requested a trade sometime before I was even traded because my days are numbered in New York, you know, as for terms of player, and I needed to go someplace where I could, could play. Now, management just also have ideas, and sometimes the ideas just don't work. And, you know, when you think you're getting better, you know, and in actuality, you actually make the team even worse. And in my situation, um, they just want someone who they thought could do what I did better and, and more frequently. So um, they made the move, and um, it didn't work out, uh, but it worked out for me. I ended up going to Toronto and playing very well and had a, and had a great time. So um, it was good for me. I didn't really want to leave New York, but from a professional standpoint and a career, it was a good move for me. Well, people, when they think Mookie, they always think Mets. You know what I'm saying? Because yes. if, you, if you take the list of the biggest events in Mets history – it's always going to be top three. The Mookie Wilson hit ball through the legs of Buckner. I mean, that's as iconic as a baseball moment. If you put, I think if you hired any sports company to put together ten clips from baseball as a montage to the opening of a show, that would be one of the clips. It would be one. Am I wrong saying that? That would be one no, of the clips, right? No, it was. Uh, it was a great moment in baseball uh, history, and. I, you know, the fans really get a chance to enjoy it. And all of baseball really, you know, has really benefited from it because it is really one of the most iconic plays in all of baseball. Not just New York, but all of baseball. And anywhere you go, all people will remember that. Yes, all it's baseball. all of baseball. That's so what I'm saying. So, you yeah. can go back to when it started. This is one of the ten clips that makes the montage. It's just, it was just surreal. And, you know, Boston finally is going to get rid of the curse. They're on the verge of winning. Here comes Mookie. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So now I know you've been asked a million times. I know it probably it, it makes you crazy. But walk us through that whole moment. Because, look, I, I always, if I said, if I ever talk to Mookie directly and I get the chance, I'm doing it now, I want to hear it out of his mouth. Like, just relive that moment like we're there. Like, what's going through your mind? Like, as you're running down the base, are you thinking, oh, man, is the ground out the first? Are you cursing in your mind? And then you see it go through his legs. I mean, what's that feeling like? I can't even imagine. Well, it is a moment where, you know, you, you fight hard because you don't want to let the team down because the, the three guys in front of me actually set the stage. Two strikes, and they battled and got hits. And now it's my turn. So I, I'm... In the beginning, I'm not thinking I'm going to get an opportunity to get up to play it. But once I do, not a pressure zone, i got to really, really battle to not make the last out. It is, this is what I don't want to do. And um, as it turned out, um, I, I fought off a lot of pitches, uh, 10 pitches. I didn't know it was 10 pitches some years later when I joined that count them. <laughs> it was you know, an but, epic, epic uh, uh, Yes, yeah, so that, that in itself was unusual for me, but... For people, it, it, it was for people listening that don't know baseball, a 10 pitch yeah. bat is epic. It's unbelievable. And you were yeah. battling. You were in there. It was, it was a really, really tough at bat. And probably the greatest at bat of my life. You know, I've never had one that lasts with that kind of pressure and, and that kind of concentration. If I had concentrated at bat for 12 years, I'd better have been a hitter. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't work out. But when the ball was in, you know, I, you hit the ball like that, you just know it's a routine out. I mean, this is, look, this major league is professional. You're not going to miss a ball like that. And um, running hard, and then when the ball goes between his legs, no one was more surprised at me. I know Billy. I know what he's been doing. I know what he's done over years. I know what kind of player he was. There's no way he misses that ball. But when he did, um, you know, I, I was too shocked. For words, I was really lost because after this ball, I was running second base. I don't know why. The game was over. <laughs> I was kind of locked in. So I just the way baseball is. Things happen. You never know. That's why you play to the last time. That's well. That's exactly it. You never know what's going to happen. You got to play yeah. it equally hard every single at bat. Now you know. I feel for Bill Buckner because he's a guy, a great career hitter, always a, you know, another professional player. 
Uh, I mean, have you spoken to Bill since then? I mean, because now here's this guy with this great career, great numbers. He's only remembered for the ball going through his legs and that play giving the Mets the World Series and they could have, you know, broke the curse at boss. And that's, you mentioned Bill Buckley, that's the first thing you hear for him. I, I can't imagine what that must be like to go through that kind of feeling. Well, yeah, actually, Bill is doing very well. And we, we talk all the time. We actually are very, very good friends has become very good friends over the years, and we do a lot of things together. Um, and he is he is fine. He is very open uh, about the whole situation now. He talks about it very candidly, and he understands it. It, it was a little, little awkward there at the beginning, but he has really grown and become a better person for it, and he accepts it for what it was, as I do. I, he accepts it for what it was. It's part of baseball that happens. If it had been any other situation, no one would even remember it. But it was the World Series between two clubs who were fighting their own demons in their past. And um, it just made things, it just magnified the situation that much more. Um, now, I must add that I think that he gets a little too much rip about um, the whole situation because a lot of things happened before that ball was even hit. And uh, it's no fault of Bill, but he didn't miss the ball. He accepts that. And um, he, he's moving on with it and, and going on with his life. But it's been a great time. He accepts it. He's part of baseball history. There's nothing he can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it other than just say, you know, just, just ride the wave and the way it ends up, that's where it goes. Yeah, it, 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 it's just really sad because, again, for such a, a, a great player and having that, it's, it's, it's just something. People got to get past it. It's, just, it's an error in a game is what it yeah. is. It's just an error in a game. Now, you know, after the 86 years, you know, the, the, the season, it, it, there was so many different things that happened. You know, Keith Hernandez was named the team captain in 87. And then yeah. all of a sudden, Gary Carter becomes the, the co-captain. What was behind yeah. that? Was there some resentment? Did Gary Carter think he was like the marquee player, that he should have been named the captain? What happened well, behind the scenes with all that? What's the real story behind that? Well, now, I can't tell you what happened behind the scenes and all that because they don't involve us when they start naming captains and stuff. We know that it was done, you know, and I think, that, you know, I, I think that it's public knowledge that Gary was a little critical of Keith being the captain. Now, whether what conversation he had with management, I don't know. I, but, you know, I just know the results, and the results was he was named captain. So I, I think that's, that's as far as I can go with that to, to give you the story behind it. I have no idea. It wouldn't begin to even speculate on. I mean, did they did they did they come to the players and and get input on who should be named the captain of the team? You would think they would want the players all in unison to be behind a guy. No, in this situation, there was no communication with players whatsoever about who should be captain. None whatsoever. Do you think there should have been? Well, and normally you would think so, but um, <laughs> it wasn't. So I you know. It, the players don't need you to name their captains. They know who their captains are. You know, that's the first thing. But sometimes management feels the need to put C on people's chest. So, we know so you got to live with it. So yeah. with, with that being said, who really were the leaders behind the scene on that 86 team and in, in that, that era? If you had to pick out the three it, names. It, it's, it's, it's no question. We had, we had a lot of leaders that was in that clubhouse. When I said a lot of leaders, we had, you know, guys that was in the, in, in the pitcher stand, which Bobby O'Heater is a great pitcher. Uh, who was a veteran pitcher who was there with the um, starting pitcher and stuff. We had Keith Nets who was the field general in the infield. He would talk more to the mound with the pitchers and, and all of that. And you have to give Gary his credit. Gary was, Gary was the, a leader in terms of he controlled the game from the pitcher standpoint. What's being called, you know, who's going to pitch to, who's not going to pitch to. So you, you got more than one leader on the club. And normally you, you have a captain, but I don't know what the captain's supposed to benefit of, I don't know, just to have something documented or whatever. But, you know, the unofficial captain on that team has always been Keith Hernandez. Keith Hernandez so that's just where we go. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I'm hearing it right yeah. from you, and no one knows better than you. Listen, yeah. we, we got a few more minutes, so I just want to touch on a few things real quick. Uh, I know there was a time period when so much happened with the team. Like you, you, I think you left in, in 89, if my baseball memory is right. But I remember they brought in Greg Jeffries in 88, and he just seemed to be resented by the team. And then you had Dykstra and McDowell, who were, again, just like uh, Mitchell and Ray Knight, real personality-type guys. And then they're traded for Juan Samuel. I mean, 
and then you ended up going. It's like it seemed yeah. like all the real faces and heart and life and soul of the team were gone in like a blink of an yeah. eye. Uh, was there a lot of resentment when they brought Jeffries up the way that they did? Well, you know, I, I think there was some resentment in that, but, you know, that was no fault, you know, uh, you know, uh, of Greg, uh, of Jeffries. Uh, management just brought in a young player who was going to be, you know, the, the next savior of the organization, and it, it just didn't pan out that way. Um, you know, he just didn't have a good relationship with his teammates. Uh, for various reasons, and it just didn't work out. It just did not work out the, the way management thought it was going to work out. And it happens to a lot of clubs. Sometimes you bring a guy in that just doesn't, that just doesn't fit, you know, and for whatever right. reason. And it could be personality, you know, conflict, or, and, and whatever reason. Um, but Jeffrey was a pretty good ball player. He had a pretty good career, but it just didn't pan out with the Mets. Yeah, to me, the, the way I always looked at it was, what did the Mets need saving from? Or, or, or need another franchise space. I mean, they had Strawberry. They had Gooden. How many how many rookie stars did you need? I mean, they were so ahead of the curve with talent. I mean, am I am I wrong? You guys were so ahead of the curve on talent. They needed Greg Jeffries. I'm not knocking him. I don't never met the guy. I never talked to him. But I mean, you had guys that were being spoken of as potential Hall of Famers. Doc could have been one of the 25 best pitchers ever with the with the with the with the with the, with the nasty stuff he had. He really could have been. And there's no reason Strawberry couldn't have been a five or six hundred home run guy. I mean, that's just what I thought. I mean, uh, don't you agree with that? Don't you think that was possible? Yeah, I agree with that. But, you know, um, sometimes um, guys' careers, you know, go south. For whatever, and, you know, it's documented about, you know, the situation with, with Dwight and, you know, and, and, and Straw, and that that helped in, in um, you know, turning their careers, you know, on a downward spiral. You know, um, yes, and there's still, no matter how care who you have, you still have to keep bringing in fresh players. And, and um, Jeffrey was that first player to bring in. So, yes, we had talent, but you can't wait until your talent is gone before you start bringing in new talent. I think that's a mistake a lot of, ball, a lot of organizations make. You wait till ball players get too old and over the hill before you start, you know, regenerating that, that, that energy. And um, that was their intent. It just didn't work out. Well, that, that was very well put. You know, utilize the talent to the max that you have before you, you swap them out. I think that's very well put. Now, uh, other than being a player, I mean, I, I, you know, before I move on to the next thing I want to ask, I just wish you would have followed Doc and Straw and went to the Yankees and got a championship with the Yankees. Because so many Mets seem to have gone over. Doc left, got a ring. Straw went, had great years, got a ring. I would love to see Mookie as a Yankee go and get a ring with the Yankees. Would you ever <laughs> consider playing with the Yankees back in the day if it, if it would have came up? I'll be honest with you, I never thought about that because <laughs> in the heart of, you know, I've always considered myself uh, to be a man. And, the, you know, and back then when there's the competition between two clubs, being a Yankee was not part of the plan. All right? <laughs> <laughs> Those guys went to the Yankees after they were let go by the Mets. So, you know, if that situation had come to me, I probably would have done the same thing, but it was never uh, a thought in my mind. No, never. <laughs> you sound like Tom Seaver giving that answer. I met Tom <laughs> Seaver once, and we talked about this, and I asked him that. He was like, come on, I'm, I'm, I was called the franchise by the Mets. I could never be a Yankee. I, it was very <laughs> funny because, I mean, if you're a Met, you're a Met through and through. And uh, yeah. now you, you, had the, you, you had the privilege of working with Bobby V, who I think, Bobby Valentine is just, to me, I think he's a great manager. He gets knocked by some people, and other people love him. I think you either fall in one of those camps. You love the guy, or you don't like the guy. Where, where do you fall on Bobby V? Well, hey, Bobby V is one of my one of my favorite baseball people. I mean, you know, I, I love the guy. I think he's a great baseball mind. You know, his personality can be a little rough, you know, but, um, hey, a lot of people have those personalities that just people just don't like. Um, but Bobby is a very good baseball guy. I would play for Bobby any day of the week. I would work with Bobby any day of the week. Um, he's intelligent, and I think he has a lot to offer to the game of baseball. And, um, you know, I'd like to see him back in the game, you know, but he's one of my favorite guys. He's one of my favorite baseball players. 
I, I got to agree with you. I think in, in terms of a baseball mind, a manager, I think the biggest problem with teams and Bobby V is he knows so much, I think, that he, he just pisses off a lot of front offices and ownership because he tells them like it is. He's another guy, speaks his mind. He's very candid and honest about things, but he knows how to bring the best out of players. And I remember, you know, we talked before we went on air, Mookie, and I told you, I got the privilege of meeting you in person back in 2000, the, the last year the Mets went to the World Series when Bobby V was the manager. And you were part of that. You know, you were around the Mets. You were, you were, you know, involved in all that stuff. And Bobby V, he led them to, you know, to the World Series with the Yankees and had the pleasure of uh, participating in a charity event that Bobby, uh, uh, you know, sponsored. And I got to meet, you know, the whole team, yourself included, and him. And he's just a real gentleman. And his knowledge of baseball is just, it's, it's, it's striking when you just talk to the guy about the game, what he knows. So that's yeah, my he takeaway. Gets it. He gets it. So... Now, let's segue. They, you know, the Red Sox hired Bobby V, and they bring him in. And I immediately thought that was a bad fit. I was like, you know, the, 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 the inmates are running the asylum over there. It's just insane. And they're going to bring Bobby V in to try to clean that up? I thought that was just like failure from the beginning. I mean, what's your thoughts on that, knowing that situation and knowing Bobby? Well, I know Bobby and knowing what was going on over there. Um, what was really a lot of written about what was going over there. I, I thought it was a bad shit. I, you know, I didn't think it was going to work. Um, but uh, Stranger Things has happened. But um, I, I thought that what happened, the way it ended up was what I thought would. I didn't think he would last very long over there, knowing Bobby and his, and his, his attitude toward the game and, and the way he does things. So, it, um, you know, it was a bad shit, and, it, you know, it did prove wrong. But um, there is some benefit from it because they ended up, moving some people and, and getting the guy that they really wanted. So, so it, it worked out for them, so that's good. So now let me ask you, we, we only have a minute or two left. When's Mookie going to be like uh, in, in some leadership role with the Mets now? I, I think that the Mets need to bring back the, you know, the faces of the franchise from the past that people love. And, I, you know, you're one of the more beloved figures in Mets history. Why don't we see Mookie back on the team in some, you know, coaching or managerial type position doing stuff? Well, you ask me a question that I can't begin to answer because I don't have, you know, any control over uh, who they hire and who they fire and, and, and that stuff. Um, you know, if you ask me, do I have the desire to do that? Well, of course you do. I mean, what coach don't? I mean, if baseball has been your life, then you definitely want to, you know, be in it for as long as you possibly can or, or for as long as you feel you have something to offer. So um, I don't know when that will happen. I don't know if that will happen, but um, I'm, I'm happy. And I'm going to take one day at a time, and um, I'm going from there. And that's, that's about as far as I can go. Okay, rapid fire. Uh, one thing in baseball you wish you could have accomplished that you didn't? I would have liked to have um, actually won another championship, and I, I, I didn't. Um, the other thing I would have liked to do is um, I played at the highest level. I would have loved to have managed at the highest level. So those are the two things. Favorite player you played with? Oh, man, my favorite player, uh, now we're getting a little personal. So I'm making it hard. Player. I'm making it hard. Uh, That's supposed to be easy, um, Mookie. The, the favorite player, I, I think that um, I've always had a, a very good spot with, like, Hubie Brooks has been a very good friend of mine. We've played together for, since college, and uh, he's had to be probably the closest player I've ever played with. Favorite manager? Uh, I've only played for a, a couple. Um, I have between... Um, you know, I would have to say right now, he's with the Cito and, and Davey. Okay, and toughest pitcher you ever you ever faced? Okay, day to day, Nola Ryan. Really, he was that tough. It, it wasn't. He was that tough. Yes. Even and, and, and when you were playing, he's already what was he late thirties, early forties? <laughs> I don't know, but he was good. <laughs> <laughs> best hitter you ever saw? The best hitter? Yeah. Oh, man, the best. I've seen so many good ones, I think. Yeah. Uh, day in and day out, man, I, I tell you, um, Tony Quinn was awesome. I, You know what? I, I must be feeling psychic today because before he said Tony Quinn, I thought to myself, he's going to say Tony Quinn or Wade Boggs. Or maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe George Brett, but Tony Quinn was incredible. Listen, Mookie, yeah. I know you got a million other people to, sp to speak to. You even gave us some extra time. I just want to thank you. Everybody listening out there, the great Mookie Wilson, you don't walk. I want you to run to your bookstore by Mookie Life 
Baseball and the 86 Mets. It's a great book, Mookie Wilson with Eric Sherman. Great read, and if you get the chance to see Mookie live in person at one of the signing events, please go down. It'll be uh, a great life experience. I got. You know what I'm going to do when we're done, Mookie? I'm going to look up. I would make a prediction that a photo of you running down first base and the ball going through Buckner's leg, signed by both of you, is probably one of the top three memorabilia pieces that gets sold. I'm going to do some research on this, and hopefully we talk in the future. I'm going to let you know. Do you know offhand where it ranks if it <laughs> no. is like the number one and number two selling? No, I, I really don't. Because there's not a show I've been to for any kind of sports-related thing where that's not one of the main pieces of sold. I'm going to look that up just out of curiosity. Mookie, it's been great having you on. You're welcome back anytime, my friend. Okay, thank you. Take care, everybody. The great Mookie Wilson. Yeah. Thanks, Mook. That was incredible. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Hey, anytime, man. Look forward to seeing you at the Mets game one of these days. All right. Hopefully we work it out, okay? All right. <laughs> you got it, my All friend. All right. Take okay. care, buddy. Bye-bye. Great luck with the book. Hey, right, thanks again. Okay. Take care. Hey, Adam. Yeah. That was great. That was really great. Mook, he's a oh, great yeah. guy. Dude, he's got to get so All right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. You get so much uh, stuff to work on. So many things to work on right now. Uh.